It's that time again, 25 fantastic DOS games out of the last 100 I've played. Let's get to it. Number 25, Champ Kong. In the early 80s, it was commonplace for arcade games to be ported to home systems. And unless you had a ColecoVision, this usually resulted in a much inferior version graphically. But if you were lucky, it would retain the spirit of the original in the gameplay department. Flash forward to the mid-90s, and personal computers were the dominant device, having beaten the microcomputer boom into submission. A small indie team called the Champ Programming Corporation specialised in remaking those classic arcade titles, but with better graphics and smoother gameplay that the 90s now afforded them. Champ Kong is one of those, and it's a perfectly playable DOS port of Donkey Kong, with optional additional levels. Number 24. Bricks. Another arcade clone, this time of Puznik by Taito. Bricks has you selecting a series of bricks, using the arrow keys in space, then moving them so that they combine together. But beware! There are traps and tricks abound in the many levels, and they can leave you with one brick left over, or simply end your quest to destroy all the bricks instantaneously. This clever little puzzle title might seem a bit cumbersome without mouse support, but when you've got your thinking cap on and you're trying all the different permutations of brick matching, you'll not notice. Number 23. Will Harvey's Zany Golf. The original mouse-driven mini-golf game. You'll soon forget about the dated graphics and sound, because that simple mouse-controlled system for hitting your ball is utterly timeless, and the inventive and zany courses remain as entertaining as they ever did. Ever wanted to play pinball with a golf ball? How about putting one under a giant bouncing hamburger? Or defying physics entirely by controlling the ball with a mouse on certain surfaces? Some games are delectable in their simplicity and you'll be putting your way to glory when you discover Will Harvey's bizarre world of zany golfing goodness. Number 22. Oh no! More Lemmings! If DMA Design had released this game instead of Lemmings, it would be regarded as one of the finest of all time. But because it came out later that year, it's just an expansion pack to the original trailblazing Lemmings game. Oh no, more Lemmings! Provides a hundred new levels for the DOS version of Lemmings, and was released both as an expansion disc that required the original game and a standalone release. So, what's it doing sat so low on the list? Well, there's absolutely nothing remarkable about it whatsoever. It's just more levels for Lemmings, and that's both its strength and weakness. As aside from new art assets, it doesn't really do anything new whatsoever. Number 21. Capitalism. Possibly the driest game I've ever played on the channel, capitalism is all about business. You set up a company, manage products and logistics and pricing while dealing with your profit margins and shares in the stock exchange and company liquidity and all those insider terms. The 4 pin system makes sense and while it's not going to why anyone in the graphics department, it's actually a superb and complex business management simulator that serves as an unforgiving economic sandbox for you to crash and burn in. Sure, that's only going to appeal to a select group of people, but in this game they'll find all their number crunching, product proofing dreams. Number 20. Fallout. War. War never changes. And neither do falling blocks. Until they do. Fallout is a puzzle game with absolutely no post-apocalyptic elements whatsoever, save for one. It has bombs! Match three of the same colour either side on, top down or diagonally and watch those blocks explode. Or hit bombs with blocks to cause them to explode even more. Your remaining blocks will resemble a wasteland in no time as you skillfully match colours and beat high scores. In this colourful title with one of the more unfortunate titles in gaming hindsight. But instead of anyone talking about Brad Taylor's entertaining puzzler, they'll be making cheap jokes about the other Fallout games like I'm doing. The jokes on them though is Brad Taylor helped create Scum, the backbone for some of the greatest LucasArts adventure games ever. Good work, Brad. Number 19. Eradicator. 
With its build-like engine with adjustable key bindings and the ability to seamlessly switch between first and third person, Eradicator is one of those forgotten shooters that implements a lot of cool ideas together in one big mash, and doesn't do a half bad job of making them all fit. You play one of three protagonists, like in Hexen, and much like that game there's a lot of environmental puzzles and switch hunting instead of key cards, and some first person platforming elements. Unfortunately that's not something I'm the best at, and I didn't have the opportunity to play enough of Eradicator to be entirely sure it's pure gold, but I'm willing to cut this FPS game some slack given that it was up against Duke Nukem 3D and Quake. Just a shame it never got SVGA graphics, or a source port as there's a lot of really innovative features here. Number 18. Shufflepuck Cafe Did you like Pong? Want a first person version with bizarre opponents, great AI, tournament mode and multiple modifiers? Step forth Shufflepuck Cafe, a game from my childhood that perfectly captures the redoubtable sport of air hockey with ease. Click on a strange opponent and simply move the mouse or the arrow keys in order to control your paddle. Each opponent has different strengths and weaknesses and some have special moves. Figure out how to combat all this and prevent the puck from hitting the glass at the back of your side of the table. And then go on to become the champion. Number 17. Chessmaster 2000 when I played this game I didn't realise that the arrow keys could move about the squares and enter could select your pieces. What a mistake! Instead I sat typing moves in like a Luddite, mainly because Chess Master was released in the mid 80s and I wasn't expecting intuitive controls, a smooth interface or a work mode. The first in a series of chess games from Software Toolworks, this won the Dutch Open Computer Chess Championship outright and became the first commercially released software to do so. What this means is that if you ever want a mean game of chess with an 80s DOS style, this is probably the best one. You know, except for the sequel, Chess Master 2100 that rendered it utterly redundant. Or number 16, Cyrus. With a dazzling array of options and a nifty EGA isometric board, Cyrus is even prettier than Chess Master despite coming out two whole years before it. More importantly though, with a ridiculous number of difficulty levels, Richard Lang's championship winning chess system outperforms the more well known Chess Master series. There's something charmingly utilitarian in the 80s about it that just draws you in, and its timeless keyboard driven gameplay can still be enjoyed to this day. Number 15. Monopoly Deluxe Chess might be the best selling board game in history, but of the modern board games nothing comes close to Monopoly a unique game about the dangers of a certain economic model. You pick a playing piece and travel around a board acquiring property and paying rent on properties owned by your competitors. You buy and sell and there's a lot of random chance involved. The game leans into this by literally having a card drawing system called Chance alongside Community Chest. These can be both beneficial and disastrous and simulate the highs and lows of being a budding property tycoon. Virgin's translation of the board game is highly customizable and was the first one to truly get it right. With excellent full colour graphics and animations, humorous sounds and all the infuriating foibles of the game encapsulated in a nice graphical system. Whether you're playing with friends or against the AI, this board game offers an epic game of acquisition. Number 14. Centipede Remember those early 80s DOS ports I was talking about before? You're trapped in an enchanted forest with only your magic wands for company, when insects start attacking you in continuous waves, one of them being a crawling centipede that you must destroy the segments of. Unfortunately, other insects seek to kill or distract you or even enable the centipede to progress towards you faster. They all have their own abilities and unique sounds and are quite frustrating to deal with at times, as you have to focus on both them and the ever encroaching Centipede. Centipede was a classic 80s arcade game and this DOS conversion is good stuff. Number 13. Acid Tetris Honestly there's not all that much that needs to be said about this one. Do you like Tetris clones? 
I've played a lot of them on this channel. Acid Tetris is the best execution so far. The core gameplay is exactly what you need it to be. The graphics and menu systems are well designed and the little smiley face is a nice touch. The soundtrack is impeccable with a terrific remix of the Game Boy Tetris music thrown in there for good measure. So if you want something that's nostalgic and DOS based, but don't want to go all the way back to the 80s for your falling blocks fix, Acid Tetris is an excellent choice. Number 12. Buck Rogers Countdown to Doomsday I went in expecting a lazy space shooter with a brand name tie-in. Instead, what I witnessed was my first steps in what has now commonly been referred to as a gold box game. Gold Box was a series of role-playing games from SSI that shared a common engine, named after the distinctive gold colour of their big box releases. These Dungeons & Dragons RPGs were gradually tweaked and improved between the late 80s and early 90s, and Countdown to Doomsday was a beneficiary of this, essentially being a sci-fi reskin of the already established D&D and Gold Box system. So if you want a text-heavy and stat-heavy blobber with a strong adherence to the AD&D rule set, then this spin-off, while never reaching the heights of its fantasy brethren, is still definitely worth your time. Number 11. Star Control Toys for Bob took elements from two entirely different games and fused them into one, then layered smart design decisions and great presentation over the top. Thus the first Star Control game was born. You're in charge of a galactic empire that has to expand through star systems, which is the default plot for every turn-based space conquest game before or since. When combat arises though, you're thrown into space war or asteroid style top-down shooter as your crafts duke it out. With many custom scenarios and a clever option to allow the player the choice of not having to play the strategic or combat elements of a game if they don't want to, Star Control is an absolute winner. Number 10. TNT Evolution Much like my Lemmings entry earlier, this one has the exact same gameplay as Doom 2, with only the maps, some textures and the soundtrack differing from that game. Released as one half of Final Doom, Evolution's reputation has suffered with the passage of time and the many great maps available on the Doom modding scene that surpass it. Even back in the day, there were plenty of alternatives for free online, and id Software only swooped in at the last minute and made it an officially licensed Doom product. So why did it make the top 25? Because it's still Doom! It doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it's still just as good in the gameplay department as the title it's adding levels to. So while there may be dozens or even hundreds of better megawads out there that detract from it, Evolution is still a fine shooter. Number 9. Championship Manager 2, the definitive football management game for DOS. No music, no sound, text and static images for graphics, and optional audio commentary that was available in this version alone. Most people switched it off and it didn't make a return. The Championship Manager series has been called a glorified database for a niche audience by critics, but this stat-heavy turn-based strategy with real-time matches is one of the most addictive games in history. You see, for a decade straight, every iteration of Championship Manager was better than the last with the series peaking in 2002. You take on the role of a manager of a British football club or national team in the mid-90s, you guide your club to glory or to hideous defeat, as you scramble not to get sacked by the board of directors. You control and replace a squad of players that you rotate in and out of games, and get hopelessly lost in a world of numbers and button-driven menus. While entirely redundant now, the foundations of what would become one of the biggest strategy game series in gaming today are all here. Number 8. Ripper If you hate slow-moving FMV-heavy games with difficult puzzles, then Ripper will be absolute nightmare fuel for you and should be avoided at all costs. If you enjoy the novelty of watching Hollywood caliber actors and B-movie nobodies choose scenery and ham it up, then this game is for you. Starring a foul-mouthed Christopher Walken and a clutch of other great character actors and sporting possibly the best game theme song of all time in Don't Fear the Reaper, Ripper is a sleuthing game where you play Detective Jake Quinlan 
on the hunt for justice and revenge against a copycat Jack the Ripper style cyberspace killer. Unfortunately, it's belaboured with a younger Scott Cohen, who hadn't quite found his acting chops yet before blossoming into a capable hand on TV. If you can get past the cheese and Detective Quinlan's glacial walking speed, then a gritty cyberpunk detective story with puzzles as brutal as its murders awaits you. Number 7. Lure of the Temptress Sure, when compared to what Sierra and LucasArts were doing in terms of presentation, there's a lot about the debut of Revolution Software that falls short, but what it lacks in polish, Lure of the Temptress makes up for in charm, with its unique in-house virtual theatre engine and atmospheric fantasy world. After a few initial quirks are acknowledged, you'll be off to the races and escaping your dank and inhospitable prison. Of note is that if you emulate the MT-32, you'll probably just get atmospheric sound throughout the game. It does have a soundtrack, but I had to play it through ScumVM in order to get it to play. And the effects are also played through whatever device you use for music. Not ideal. After making it out into the wider world, you'll discover that the characters around you don't just stand there. They have their own agenda, and it's a real-time environment that you're operating in, and an intriguing point-and-click adventure will await you. Number 6. Noctropolis Point-and-click adventure designers were surprisingly inventive back in the 90s, and Noctropolis is no exception. An FMV-laden comic book-inspired tale with an intriguing interface, and lots of hand-drawn material to leaf through. But unlike the earlier FMV entry Ripper, this game has a lot less watching and a lot more playing involved courtesy of mechanics pilfered from the likes of Sierra. You're a lonely bookstore owner who is obsessed with comics, and one particular comic book hero called Dark Shear. Events conspire to place you within the world of your superhero, and you learn that you now have to become the caped crusader and destroy his foes or something like that. I never made it out of the bookstore, but I liked what I saw and it turns out that my instincts were good, as this one was both critically acclaimed and got a recent remaster. Number 5. Radix Beyond the Void Ever play Descent and think to yourself, I wish this was more like Doom? Ever play Doom and think to yourself, I wish that Doom guy went into the gates of hell in a spaceship? Radix is an uncomplicated game that answers both these musings commendably, with a super awesome ship sporting seven different types of weaponry and rocking a soundtrack to go with it in the style of Doom. It even heavily borrows from the plot of the original Doom, with a terrifying disturbance in space emanating from the void, and you being the only thing stopping these demons or aliens from destroying the known universe. Thanks to the Rad engine based on Delphi Doom, Owners of Radix 2.0 can now fly in true 3D with widescreen support. So turn that brain off, jump in the cockpit, and get blasting. Number 4. Rayman In this colourful platformer, you play a series of disconnected body parts known as Rayman, as he jumps along levels, teeming with baddies who wish him harm. The controls and native gamepad support make this a smooth experience, and the bright and consistent artwork adds to its charm with great visual appeal. Originally released on the Atari Jaguar, the DOS sport is capable and rarely suffers from any slowdown as our hero leaps from vines and platforms and uses giant bouncing fruits to aid him. It's easy to see why this game from French developer Michel Ancel would lead to an entire franchise built around this magical Rayman. Number 3. War Diary did you like Warcraft? Do you want more of that, but with the Koreans fighting the Japanese? That would be the easiest way to make a pitch for War Diary, a Korean RTS that came out of nowhere to engulf a full 20 minutes of my time. Truth is that there are some substantial and interesting differences between the two games. Your economy is bolstered through selling resources for gold on the marketplace. You have to both train and arm your standing forces, and there's a day-night cycle too. War Diary sits somewhere between the first Blizzard RTS and its sequel, and while the graphics have aged, the gameplay and mechanics are palatable, and overall it's well worth a look. Number 2. Stonekeep Brian Fargo's RPG plays like a love letter to the late 80s and early 90s blobber scene, mainly because it was meant to come out around that time. The perpetually delayed RPG was long in the tooth in terms of gameplay when it finally appeared, 
but still scratched the itches of fans who remembered the likes of the Bard's Tale and Dragon Wars. Using 3D rendering and motion capture instead of pixel art to ward off the ravages of time, Stonekeep's familiarity to fans and unwavering adherence to its high fantasy concepts means that it's well worth your time to quest forth for 20 to 40 hours and defeat the villainous dark god Cool Coom. And precisely because it's a classic grid-based blobber, it's sitting in second position, which is indicative of my massive bias in favour of that genre. Most of the top five honestly could have been interchangeable, but there was no doubt as to what number one was going to be as soon as I played it. Number one, Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness. This is the one, the best DOS RTS game ever made. And other than TIE Fighter, this is my favourite DOS game full stop. I can't put into words just how far ahead this Blizzard title is from number two on the list. It's not even close. It featured in my first successful video on the channel, and its name is familiar to millions of people worldwide. Warcraft 2 walked so that StarCraft and World of Warcraft could run, improving on its predecessor orcs and humans in almost every conceivable way, and laying down not only a smooth RTS experience, but an inviting accessibility that others just couldn't match. High production values, humorous characters, timeless art and soundtrack, and two excellent campaigns to play. It has been a source of thousands of hours of evening entertainment for me and my family. It popularised both the terrain-based fog of war and right-click to move, innovations that have become defaults to this day. It was a mega hit, and the best-selling game in the world at one point, making millions for the company and catapulting Blizzard into the mainstream. It's still rightly considered one of the greatest games ever, despite being overshadowed by its spin-offs. And it got a widescreen patch recently. If you somehow haven't played it, I implore you to do so, whether it's through DOS or the Combat Edition or Wargus or GOG. Did you like that top 25? I have a pile of them here and all kinds of scripted videos. Feel free to check them out. And if you like what you see, you can always subscribe.